everyone. My name is Yohansa Bipasha Bhavani Dharatna, and today I'm going to be talking about catalyzing global health action for endometriosis so we can no longer make it an endomystery. Before we dive into the presentation, here's a little bit about myself. I'm a senior studying at, du- at the Dubai Scholars Private School, and I'm a global teen advisor for Girl Up, a UN foundation initiative. I'm an athlete at the NBA basketball school in Dubai, captain of the U19 girls basketball team at school, founder of my school's first medical society, and I also run a non-profit called Elevate. So now let's dive straight into the topic. So the reason I've chosen to talk about endometriosis is because although it affects an estimated 190 million women worldwide and approximately 1 in 10 women in the US, there's no known cause of the disease and no cure. Because of the lack of education about endometriosis, pain or other symptoms are often dismissed as being part of a woman and just simply misdiagnosed. This often causes a delay of a decade or more in receiving the proper treatment for the disease. This topic is crucial because medical professionals often misdiagnose women who have endometriosis for two reasons. They know a little bit about endometriosis because of lack of focused education in medical schools and endometriosis symptoms can be similar to those of more common diseases like IBS, appendicitis, ovarian cancer and so much more. Unfortunately, 1 in 25 women are told that the pain they feel is mental and rather than treating their physical symptoms, physicians sometimes refer them to a mental therapist. Because of their painful dysmenorrhea, also known as painful periods, women are unable to live their lives to the fullest. They often have to quit jobs and other and other responsibilities, as the pain is just intolerable. This often results in the women having poor mental health, as both their social and personal lives are quote-unquote described as ruined. As a community, we must help advocate for this cause and bring more attention to this mystery so that we can help the future generation of women and support their needs by making them feel heard and giving them the chance to get accurately diagnosed. Here are a list of countries with an approximate number of years in diagnostic delay. As you can see, diagnosing endometriosis takes a lot of time, and as a result, millions of women are pushed into a never-ending cycle of improper treatments, which in turn affects their daily lives. So now let's dive deeper into exactly what endometriosis is. Basically, when tissue similar to the interior lining of the uterus or endometrium mistakenly migrates and implants in areas outside the uterus, primarily in the pelvic region, is when we have an endometriosis situation. However, in rare cases, it can even grow in the lungs, which we will explore later. These implants respond to monthly fluctuations of hormones, which include estrogen and progesterone during the menstrual cycle. Usually, the endometrial cells inside the uterus are reacting to the changing hormone levels by breaking down and then being released as a monthly period. But when these tissues that are growing outside the uterus do the same thing, they have no way of getting out. During the cycle, estrogen causes this out-of-place tissue to grow, often causing severe pain and lesions to develop. This is what we call as endometriosis. Now let's dive deeper into the different types of endometriosis. Endometriosis is associated with immune and hormonal disruptions. As endometriosis grows, it causes inflammation, which can lead to adhesions, scarring, internal bleeding, urinary dysfunction, and even infertility. The physical pain can be severe, which can lead to psychological distress. It's a combination that in many ways can have a debilitating effect on an individual's life. Endometriosis can be subdivided into two categories, which is intrapelvic endometriosis and extrapelvic endometriosis. Intrapelvic endometriosis includes ovarian, also known as endometriomas, superficial peritoneal, and deep infiltrating. Then we have extrapelvic endometriosis. It's quite rare, but it's when endometriosis tissue or endometrial tissue um, migrate across the body and land in areas such as the lung and pleural cavity. Now let's look at the mechanism of how these tissues move. Let's look at the pathogenesis of endometriosis. Endometriosis isn't completely understood, but appears to be multifactorial. It's generally accepted that the most common mechanism for developing intrapelvic endometriosis is when endometrial tissue shed during the menstruation cycle travels retrograde from the uterine cavity backwards to the fallopian tubes and into the peritoneal cavity. On the other hand, extrapelvic endometriosis is thought to partially occur due to lymphatic embolization of endometrial cells. Regardless of the mechanism, the consequence is that Um, the tissue ends up in unwanted places and continues to uh, respond to the um, monthly fluctuations of the hormones. We call this theory retrograde menstruation. Although 90% of women have retrograde menstruation, only 1 in 10 women are diagnosed with symptomatic endometriosis. A possibility is that immune and other clearance systems protect most women. But again, more research is needed to determine why retrograde menstruation affects women differently. 
Now, we'll be exploring methods that can potentially diagnose endometriosis. Existing methods of endo diagnosing endometriosis include laparoscopic pathology and imaging testing. The only way to verify pelvic endometriosis accurately is to undergo di diagnostic laparoscopy with pathology confirmation of biopsy specimens. A timely incision will be made in the patient's abdomen, and samples of the tissue in question will be removed and sent to a lab to be viewed under a microscope to confirm its origin. Imaging testing is helpful, but it's not definitive. Despite popular opinion, clear evidence of endometriosis of any form is not visible through CT scans, MRIs, or even ultrasounds. While imaging testing, pelvic exams, and other um, rectal exams can indicate suspicion of ovarian and deep endometriosis, they cannot confirm it. Nevertheless, it is a common practice to obtain um, ultrasounds and MRIs before undergoing laparoscopic surgery for endometriosis, as this can help plan the surgical approach. Now we'll be looking at methods that are still being tested. Unfortunately, there is still no blood, urine, or saliva test that can diagnose endometriosis. However, there are studies being done on different inflammatory markers, such as um, cytokines, growth factors, so that we can also find a more uh, non-invasive approach to diagnosing the disease. As a result, more people can afford um, undergoing and taking a lab test rather than going for surgery. So that way, um, they can easily access proper treatment without being misdiagnosed. And as a result, we as a community have to continue to spread awareness and support research and funding towards this disease. Now we're going to be looking at the histology of endometriosis after laparoscopy. The picture that I've got here is a picture that um, I observed under the microscope at a local hospital where I'm conducting research on endometriosis. And to confirm um, whether the tissue is of an endometriosis tissue, a pathologist must find out uh, both glandular cells and endometrial stromal cells present on the specimen. Then we can distinguish and diagnose that the person who um, the specimen is from has endometriosis. Before any surgery is done, the doctor usually goes through something known as an AS ASRM classification guide that uses a point system to try and quantify endometriotic lesions based on number, size, and location of lesions upon laparoscopy to figure out what further treatment is needed. A score is then used to find out the stage of endometriosis. This is how um, a typical ASRM, ASRM classification guide looks like, with each stage having uh, specific uh, measurements for the lesions that are found upon laparoscopy and other imaging techniques. Then we're going to move on to surgical treatment options. There are three main surgical treatment options as of now, which include deep excision, cold excision, and hysterect. Now we're going to be looking at the call to action so that we can spread more awareness about the disease. As Helen Keller said, alone we can do so little, but together we can do so much. There are so many ways in which you can engage with the community. Start off by joining local support groups for those affected by endometriosis or create one so that people can share their experiences and offer support to one another. Collaborate with organizations like Endometriosis Foundation of America, Endometriosis UK, or even local women's health groups to amplify their efforts and provide valuable resources for people in your community. And advocate for pol policy change so that we can create and support petitions calling for increased funding for endometriosis research, better healthcare policies, and improved access to treatment so that together we can achieve for the greater good in women's health in the medical field. The references of um, the different sources I used during my entire presentation. And this brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening and sticking out for, till the end. Feel free to reach out using the handles that I've listed. And most importantly, thank you so much to the incredible admin team at the Global Health Leaders Conference for allowing me to um, talk about something that I'm super passionate about. I hope you found something informative throughout this presentation, and I hope we can strive for bettering women's health in the future. Thank you so much. Bye.